Hello, welcome everyone. Great to see so many familiar people joining us here in the chat. Welcome um, to our COVID-19 webinar series on vaccines and variants. I'm Kristen Uhlenbrock and I work at the Institute for Science and Policy. We are a project of the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. Together with my museum colleagues and our partners at the Colorado School of Public Health, we are really excited that you've joined us today for this Redux, this bonus episode back with our COVID um, colleagues. So um, many of you that may know, we did about 30 episodes between April of 2020 and April of 2021 on this topic. And we did promise that we would come back as a situation um, needed to bring you additional content. That's why we're here today. In preparation for today, I did go back and do a little reflection on um, what we heard and what we saw in the previous episode since April of 2020 last year. And it really was striking to see the types of questions we were asking, the science that we knew at the time, and a lot of what we didn't know. And then how much progress has been made till today. As we know, we talk about this a lot. You all know this. Science is absolutely a process. It's meant to be iterative. It is meant to explore possibilities, going down wrong turns at times and coming back. That's what makes our scientific understanding so much stronger, more verifiable, more certain. It's because that science by nature is encapsulated in certainty that really makes this pandemic really, really difficult. I also saw a little bit reflecting back um, on April of this year, 2021, as we were wrapping up this a series, that we had some springtime optimism. Vaccines were available. Our cases and hospitalizations were the way down. Um, and we were hopeful and eager for the summer. And now here we are. Um, and to be honest, personally, my optimism is being a little tested right now today. I see death rates and cases really soaring. Um, definitely a lot among the unvaccinated population. Hospitalizations are also increasing. I was even just sharing uh, with Dr. Nuzzo, you know, to make sure I heard this correctly, but our CDC director, I think she said it yesterday, at least that's when I heard it, that the Delta strain is almost two times as more contagious. So where are we in this pandemic? We're in a fourth wave for sure. Um, and as promised, we said we would come back and bring you some more content. So I am thrilled to bring you an episode today that is focused very much on vaccines and variants. We have a great guest joining us today, Dr. Jennifer Nuzzo. Dr. Nuzzo is a senior scholar at the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security and an associate professor in the Department of Environmental Health and Engineering at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. She is also a senior fellow for global health at the Council on Foreign Relations. As an epidemiologist by training, her work focuses on global health security, including a focus on pandemic preparedness, outbreak detection and response, global health systems, and infectious disease. She is extremely accomplished in so many ways. I'm not doing it justice. Uh, she's frequently in the news and media, so you may have seen her there. And I did want to share this one fun fact that as I was reading through her bio, which was she was featured in the Debunking Borat series on Amazon Prime, and then went on to serve as a COVID advisor for the Borat subsequent movie film. So I don't think we're going to get a chance to talk about that today, but I did want to just share that one fun fact about Dr. Duso. Uh, good afternoon, Jennifer, how are you doing today? Thank you so much. Thank you for that introduction. Thanks for having me. It's it's a real honor to join everyone and um, I'm uh, encouraged that people in the sunny days of August still want to hear about COVID after um, this past time, but happy to have this conversation today. Wonderful. Thank you. We're so glad you're here. So we have about an hour today, folks. Um, Dr. Nuzza is going to have a little bit of opening remarks and some slides and a presentation, and then we're going to head into Q&A. For those of you that have been here with us before, you kind of know how that works. Um, the chat feature, you can go ahead and open that up. Ask, chat, ask questions in that chat at any point throughout today's presentation. We do have a lot of the team on there helping us kind of monitor all those questions that come in. A huge thank you to those who sent questions in advance. I've got those. We're gonna to try to curate as many as possible and cover a lot of ground today, uh, but I do gonna make the disclaimer and caveat that I'm very sorry in advance that we will most likely not get to all of your great questions. Um, you all are very curious and engaged bunch. So thank you very much for sending those in. And with that, I wanna stop talking
talking, let Dr. Nuzzo have some remarks here and then we'll head into Q&A. And give me just a second as we all queue up her presentation. Great, thank you. I think I may now have the ability to move these slides myself. Let's see. Um, I just wanted to give some framing remarks to just set the stage where we are when we're talking about the variants and we're talking about the vaccines. And just a quick recap of where we are in the US. Um, at any rate, whoops, too far. Um, we've crossed the threshold of 38 million cases being reported. Um, and over uh, 630,000 deaths in the US. If you look to the right hand side of the slide, you can see the um, weekly uh, uh, case average. And unfortunately, as you can see, we are in a period of, of uh, continual e increasing in terms of the weekly cases that are uh, being in reported in the United States. The next slide down shows the deaths. And unfortunately, um, for the first time in a long time, um, deaths are on the upward um, climb as opposed to the, the downward climb. So this is obviously a disappointing situation to be in given that, you know, a couple of months ago, things were, um, I won't say looking up because they were actually looking down. They looked much um, uh, more encouraging and optimistic than they do now. Um, just to show you why um, that may be, there seems to be a slight delay in advancing my slide. So I'm just gonna, um, Maybe Kristen, if you're able, okay, good. Here's the one I want, <laughs> thank you. Great, so unfortunately the situation that we're in right now is that the US epidemic is worsening in many states. As you can see, the states with the darker colors are the ones where um, the case growth um, is happening uh, much more quickly and, and much more numerous in terms of the number of cases being reported. Um, the purple colors will not be a surprise if you've been paying attention to the news, certainly in Louisiana, Mississippi, Florida, um, Alabama, Georgia, those states are certainly in the news. We're also hearing a lot about um, concerns in, in, in Oregon. Um, conversely, we're hearing less about the Northeast and, and other parts of the country. Um, but as you can see, when you look at this map, um, it's not all quiet in all states. In fact, case numbers are increasing almost everywhere. Um, and part of that is that even within states that have high vaccination coverage, there are still gaps in immunity. There are still pockets of, of uh, people who are not vaccinated and they remain susceptible um, to outbreaks when, when you have that. Certainly the states with the lowest vaccination coverage are now seeing the highest number of cases. That seems to be quite clear in the data. But I think it's a warning to all states that when you have um, pockets of immunity, if you have um, you know neighborhoods within counties or even whole counties that are not well vaccinated, that um, you continue to see case increases, unfortunately. And that's clearly what we see here in, in this graph. There's a lot of variation across the country in terms of vaccine uptake. At the state level, we see it, but we also see it within states. And so that's important for interpreting things like, how is it that Los Angeles was having a, a rise in Delta a couple of months ago when you know California on, on balance is one of the higher vaccination states? And at the time when Los Angeles was seeing the, the rise in cases, it had about 60% um, overall vaccination coverage. It's grown since then, which is good that we've seen more vaccine uptake since then. Um, but if you kind of scroll down to the neighborhood level, there were neighborhoods that where the uptake was much, much lower. And people socialize within their neighborhoods. They socialize within their networks. And so if you have susceptibility networks that are susceptible, um, if someone gets infected, they're likely to, to, to spread it to others. Um, the good news is actually vaccination uptake has increased quite a bit since we've seen the, the rise in Delta, um, including in the states that have been hardest hit. So people are you know, starting to think that being on the fence about vaccines probably isn't working out so well. Um, and, and we're seeing more people sign up for the vaccine. So, so that's encouraging. We've heard, of course, in the news, a lot of questions about whether the vaccines are still working and whether or not they're still working against Delta. You may have seen um, statistics, overall statistics, even the CDC showed a statistic that showed um, you know, vaccine effectiveness before Delta, vaccine effectiveness after Delta, and there was a big step down and they had an overall percentage. I'm not showing that graph for a reason because I actually think it's quite misleading. And I think it's, it's easy to be misinterpreted. 
But I just wanted to kind of cover the basics of what is vaccine effectiveness, because I found that a lot of people, even you know, very scientific, scientifically savvy people sort of misinterpret it. So the most important thing you should know is that when you hear something like the vaccine is 80 or 90% effective, what that means is they're comparing a group of people who are vaccinated to people who aren't. So it's a relative measure. It's not an absolute measure. Sometimes I hear people say, if you have a vaccine that's 80% um, effective, that means if 100 people are exposed, 20 uh, of them will get infected. And, and that's not true. It's just they're comparing the vaccinated people to the, the unvaccinated people. And that relative measure is really important. And also, if you can think about what factors could influence both vaccinated and unvaccinated people's likelihood of getting infected, you can imagine that there are a lot of different variables. And in fact, there are. I have this great graphic um, that uh, my colleague Muge Sevek, who's um, at St. Andrews, uh, has shared on Twitter. I think it really um, helps show why this is so incredibly complicated. So you have things about the person, right? If you're older, we know that older folks um, sometimes don't respond as well to vaccines. It's one reason why they get a stronger flu shot. Um, we know that if you've been infected before, you probably have more protection than somebody who, who wasn't infected. Um, certainly there are demographic factors. I circled, in my view, one of the most important ones that we should all keep in mind. When there are higher levels of virus circulating in the community, everybody, including vaccinated people, will have a higher probability of coming in contact with the virus. So the likelihood that they're going to be protected is different when the virus is hard to find versus when it's all over the place. And then of course, um, there's all sorts of other, you know, more biological things, but I, I put this here to say that you may hear different numbers coming from different countries. You may hear different numbers, even when the trials were happening and we were hearing about the results from the clinical trials. Uh, we call it vaccine efficacy when it's in the context of clinical uh, trial, but in the context of real world data, it's vaccine effectiveness. The, the, the relative um, definition is the same, whether it's efficacy or effectiveness, but you would hear different data for different vaccines. And some people would try to pick the vaccine that they thought had the better number, when in fact it was really comparing apples to oranges because those, those vaccines were studied in very different populations at different points in time. And so even a vaccine that is the same could come up with a different number if it's studied at a different point in time or a different pop population. So just to maybe say, don't get too hung up on the numbers, um, particularly when comparing countries, because there are a lot of factors that go into that. We have to understand what those factors are in order to not understand if we should be concerned about the vaccines or not. And it's just sort of a kind of bottom line up front. If you listen to nothing else from this presentation and hoping this slide will advance so you can see it. Um, I just want to say the bottom line up front is that the vaccines that we have are still doing the thing that we need them to do above all which is to keep people out of the hospital and to keep them from dying, to prevent severe illness and death. This is basically why we develop these vaccines. This is um, the key feature of COVID-19 and the virus that causes it, SARS-CoV-2, that makes us so concerned about it. If SARS-CoV-2 virus weren't capable of putting people in the hospital or killing them, most of us would have never heard of it. So the good news is that the vaccines are still doing what we need them to do. And this study that I'm showing is a recent one from New York, looking at how um, the vaccine has protected uh, people from hospitalization um, over time. And you can see, I, I, I put a red box around it, still very high levels of, of vaccine efficacy, effectiveness, among people, regardless of when they were vaccinated against hospitalization and death. So good news. That said, there are some observations that the number of vaccinated people who are coming down with, who are infected, I will say, who are infected. And what we, what we mean by infective is either that you have no symptoms and you tested positive, or you have symptoms and you tested positive that percentage seems to be changing. So the, the percentage of people who, of cases who are vaccinated um, is increasing, which is something that we actually expect as we vaccinate more people. If you, invac if you over time work to vaccinate 100% of your population, if you had one case in that population, 100% of your cases would be in a vaccinated 
a person, right? So we, we do expect that the percentage of cases who are vaccinated to increase over time. But nonetheless, we are seeing an increase in um, infections among people who are vaccinated. And one of the questions is, does that mean um, the vaccine is not doing the same job that it was doing earlier? Now, if the answer to that is yes, there could be a few reasons. One could be that um, the vaccine just doesn't work as well against Delta. Or it could be that um, you got vaccinated, but now you're immune to response to the virus is less robust because it's been some time since you've gotten vaccinated. There's also another interpretation, and at least based on the United States data, and I'm preferentially only showing you data here from the United States because of what I said before, that it's really hard to compare studies from different contexts. At least in the United States data, I am less worried about people's immune systems not doing a good enough job now, six months after they've been vaccinated, in part because of this graph. And this graph shows that the increase in infections that we see among the vaccinated people, the, 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 the waning that you heard about, seems to only be, according to these graphs, and this is a recently published um, study from, from the CDC, in people who are under the age of 65. And we know that in the United States, people over the age of 65 are the ones who got vaccinated first. So if it were something about their immune system not quite doing what it's supposed to be doing, you would think that we would see it in that group too suggests to me, and my actually my colleague David Dowdy at Johns Hopkins um, pointed this out, and I want to give him credit for pointing that out, that perhaps there's something else going on. Perhaps it's about behavior and the fact that, you know, we did a whole lot of new things. Remember I said one of the most important things is if there's a whole lot more virus around, you have just more probability of coming in contact with it. And so if you're under the age of 65, and now it's a few months after you've gotten vaccinated, you're ready to get your life back. As you hear people talking about the summer of being vaxxed and waxed, right? And at the same time, the masks are no longer required. It may not be entirely surprising that we'll see more infections and um, you know, potentially um, you know, disease uh, in people who now have just more opportunities to, to be infected. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that too, but... Um, and so why could that happen? Well, it's, I think important to understand that the immune system has multiple components. And I'm not an immunologist, so you're gonna get like the epidemiologists, very high level explanation of, of immunology. But the key takeaways here is that there are your antibodies and those are usually the things that react first. Um, and then you have your cell mediated immunity and your things like your T cells and your B cells. And, and those are the things that usually click in, kick in later, um, but are really good um, at helping to protect against serious illness. Both of those components of the immune system, all the components of the immune system, um, they're, they're designed, the immune system is designed to ramp up when it sees an intruder and then after the intruder's gone to kind of calm back down. You don't wanna be in a state of constantly um, heightened immune response. Um, that would, you know, there's some, some downsides to that. So, um, so, so it's not surprising at any point and particularly the longer it's been since your vaccine to have your immune um, uh, system you know, decline, to particularly have your antibodies decline. But the question is, is that a problem? Well, there is some thought if perhaps one of the reasons why we're seeing, we're hearing about more people now um, who are vaccinated getting sick. You know, You probably heard about somebody that you know who was vaccinated but got sick and they felt lousy for a few days that perhaps that is because their antibodies have, have waned a bit. It's possible. I, I don't say think we see a great compelling case for this in the data for healthy people. We certainly see, I think, a very compelling case um, for a need to give additional vaccinations to um, on people who are immunocompromised. And that's why those, that group has already been um, you know, approved to receive a third dose. But for the average person, um, what will likely happen is that, you know, if you become exposed to the virus, first of all, no vaccine is a force field. <laughs> the vaccine doesn't keep the virus, doesn't repel the virus from your body. The virus will likely infect um, your cells. And that's how your immune system knows something's afoot and it should react. And what we can expect then, hopefully, is that your immune system will kick in. It may kick in fast enough that you never experience any kind of symptoms, that it limits the infection to a you know, small number of cells so that you don't develop symptoms. But it may not, and you may develop some symptoms. But 
the good news is that you have the other components of your immune system that we, we think, we still think, um, have a long lasting memory about um, the virus based on what the um, vaccine told us, that those, that those components of the immune system will kick in to help respond to this virus so that you don't get nearly as sick as you would have if you hadn't been vaccinated and to keep you out of the hospital and to keep you from dying. And in my view, that is exactly what we need the vaccines to do. That is the most important thing. And um, in my view, I mean, first of all, that's really what the vaccines were authorized to do. Um, that's what we, we need them for. Um, and, and I see no evidence whatsoever that they're not doing a good enough job for most people. So that's the end of my story there. <laughs> um, and so why do we care? You know, let's just give everybody a third dose, right? Third dose, maybe it'll help. Maybe it'll help ramp up their antibodies, those, those, those faster acting parts of the immune system so that they act even a little bit faster to keep the person who's infected from even developing you know, the lousy cold. Um, you know, I think if there were unlimited supplies of vaccines, I think it would probably be a straightforward no brainer answer. Unfortunately, there are not unlimited supplies of vaccines. And I just got some data today from some colleagues at, um, think, at, at the Council on Foreign Relations that reminded me of the fact that four of the five billion doses of vaccines that have been allocated to date have been used by just 10 countries, just 10 countries who unsurprisingly are high income countries. So the prospect of, of boosters is really one of a global vaccine equity consideration because we just simply don't have enough vaccines to meet today's needs to get first doses and second doses into the arms of people who are even most vulnerable. And if we think about all of the places who are currently considering like openly, you know, talking about using boosters, if we added up all the doses that they could potentially use, that's an additional billion doses that will be third shots for people, as opposed to the fact that much much, much of the world has not had an even first or second dose. And I have a graph here, which hopefully it'll load after I have advanced the slides, um, to show the fact that there are huge gaps in vaccine coverage. Africa, for instance, less than 2% of the entire continent of Africa has received a single dose of vaccine. So that's a moral problem, if you ask me. But even if you don't care about the morality of it, you should care about the pragmatism of it, which is that when you have huge populations that are unvaccinated, that is where we are most worried variants will arise. The countries that have lower vaccine coverage are the places that are more at risk for variants to emerge, in part because they're not giving vaccines to the people who are most vulnerable, particularly the immunosuppressed, who may be more likely to give rise to variants in the first place because their body has the virus for longer than some, some other patients. So if we're worried about variants, if we want to stop hearing about alpha, delta, beta, gamma, iota, I mean, all of the, the Greek letters go on. I don't know what happens when we run out of Greek letters, we'll start doubling them up. Um, then we should be really concerned about making sure we get more vaccines to others. Now you'll hear a lot of people talk about, well, we can make more and we should make more. Absolutely, but we're not. And if we try to right now, which we should be doing, trying to make more right now, it will be years before we do. And we don't frankly have that time. So it is actually a really concerning um, question as to how we in the United States can justify um, giving additional vaccines to people who may not need it to keep them out of the hospital or die when other parts of the world are literally dying for a lack of access to any vaccines whatsoever. So I'm pretty much gonna end there. And the last slide I had was just to show you sort of where we are in the rest of the world. And to remind you in the beginning, I showed you the US case map and where we were, but just to remind you that this is a global pandemic and the rest of the world continues to struggle. What I have seen over the course of this is that even countries that were very good at controlling COVID, you know, we heard for a long time that the US was not doing well, but there are a number of countries that were doing really well. They shut borders, they did all this stuff. Even those countries are really struggling right now to get around Delta. Delta just spreads too fast for many of the measures that we've relied upon in the past. And it really speaks to the importance of using vaccines to protect people. So anyway, I'll end there and looking forward to the questions that you have. I've seen a few pop up as I've been talking and I'm eager to jump in. 
Ah, thank you, Dr. Nuzo. That was a really great overview. Um, let me, sorry, get give my one second to get situated. You're absolutely right. We've had a lot of great questions. And so I want to pick up on one that came into the chat, which just picks up on a little bit of what you're talking about. And then we'll kind of go back and uh, build off and unpack some more of what you should shared. Um, but one of our guests, when we were talking about the moral imperative, or however we want to consider that in regards to global vaccination in different countries, um, the audience member had a question about the overall incidence of the virus, and in essence, of, I'm guessing how it spreads, um, and how earlier in the pandemic, Africa was largely spread spared from the spread of COVID. Um, could you talk a little bit about that when it comes to vaccines? So uh, vaccines are the only way to protect countries now uh, for the long time. I mean, obviously countries are using other measures, but it's really hard. I think one of the most telling examples of this is Australia. Australia shut its borders um, early. It had a very um, aggressive uh, travel restrictions in terms of you know, severely limiting who could return, even preventing its own citizens from returning, having um, hotel uh, quarantine for two weeks, um, you know, it, it helped them at various points, but now with Delta, I mean, we have had had Sydney, um, you know, the largest city in Australia under lockdown for it seems like months at this point. Um, I mean, that really just underscores how incredibly difficult it's going to be to, um, to, to return to normal until countries have vaccines, particularly to protect the people that we most worry about dying and the people who have the greatest level of exposure and that's healthcare workers. I really worry about healthcare workers because if we lose whole medical systems in countries that already have weak health systems, that will have generational impacts. Um, no country will be spared from this virus. It's really hard to compare numbers between countries. And I know this because I'm part of the team that runs the Johns Hopkins Coronavirus Resource Center, the map. Um, one of the things that we have seen very clearly is that countries have very different approaches to finding cases, to testing for cases, to counting cases. Um, and a big limitation is capacity. Many countries in Africa, for instance, are only really testing travelers because travelers pay for tests. So that means that the positives that they find among the travelers doesn't really represent what's happening in the country. My guess of what happened is that there are a number of countries, including probably places in Africa, that, that shut down really early. And I think that bought them time, but they can't do that forever, and not when you have people who depend on being in the street to earn money. Um, they can't do that forever. And so unfortunately, we've seen really de de devastating case increases uh, in a number of countries and probably more than what is reported based on the fact that there just isn't enough capacity to test everybody um, who comes into hospitals. They've done post-mortem exams of, of bodies and have found a lot more COVID than anybody had thought. Um, so. I think the, the most telling thing that we have seen is to look at something called excess deaths, which is just you look at the deaths and you compare the amount that occur in a period of time compared to what you would expect based on other years trends at that same time. And what we see is that the excess deaths show much more disease and death than has been reported. And I think this notion that this has been a problem of developing countries and not I'm sorry, a problem of developed countries like the United States and not a problem of developing countries is completely false. In fact, some of the excess death data shows completely the opposite. Um, it's a luxury to count your dead. I, I mean, that's a really grotesque thing to say, but it, that takes resources. Uh, I remember, I think it was last summer when we had Dr. Peter Hotez on, and um, I think the statistic that he shared during his presentation around at the time was a 10 year horizon of when he thought we could have this kind of large scale global vaccination timeframe, really helping reach um, lower socioeconomic countries. Um, what sort of timeline do you think about that? And then I want you to maybe morph that into thinking about variants and how they develop and evolve and, and some of that potential tension there with the SARS-CoV-2. Um, so we don't have 10 years. I mean, I. I think we barely have a year to have the most amount of impact. This virus is moving really quickly. I won't say that vaccines won't continue to be important after a year, but if we want to have the most impact in terms of um, preventing unnecessary deaths, protecting health systems, um, we need to vaccinate within the next year. 
And that's why I get so frustrated when I see these vaccine production timelines that stretch into the years because it'll be too little too late. The vaccines will still continue to be important. And I think that's a converse, that's when we have the conversation about boosting and other things. Once we have at least made sure that we have taken care of healthcare workers and some of the most, the people who are most likely to die should they contract the virus in, in other countries. Um, you know, that's that's the timeline um, that I think of. In terms of variants, you know, again, um, that's why we have to, to do more to, to reallocate. It's not just about bringing down all the numbers, but when you vaccinate more people in a country, it does slow the virus down. And it, I mean, we see that in the United, in the U.S. I mean, the shape of the curves in highly vaccinated states in the U.S. are much more gentle and gradual than in Florida, where it's a skyscraper right now, um, or in Texas, in other places. Um, and so what vaccines also do is they buy countries more time to use the other measures to try to prevent people from becoming infected through other ways. But it's really urgent that we give them a leg up, that we give them some level of vaccination so that they can, one, not have their health systems overwhelmed so that people don't die not only from COVID that could have been otherwise treated and, and cured um, versus, but, but other things. I mean, we know if you go to a health system with a heart attack and the health system is overwhelmed, your likelihood of surviving is, is much lower. So lots of reasons why it's pragmatically in our best interest to make sure other countries have access to vaccines, including, but not limited to, um, helping reduce the likelihood of, of the emergence of variants. So far, I'm not completely worried about a variant emerging that completely overtakes our, our vaccines, in part because I do think we have good protection against a serious disease, um, and we've seen it so far. But the fact that that could happen is worrisome. And so the idea of, um, I think there's a term for it, which is kind of the, the vaccine-induced selection. So is that, could you elaborate yeah. on that concept and yeah. that idea? That's basically disinformation. Um, we don't think that. I think that came from maybe a misinterpretation of, of what happens with antibiotics. Like, you know, you heard if you don't take your antibiotics fully, that you could um, select, uh, you know, force the, the virus, you know, the, the bacteria to find a way around the antibiotics because it's, it, you know, gets a hit but isn't, isn't killed fully. Um, I think maybe there was a thought that the, the virus, you know, now seeing a vaccinated population can, can, you know, outwit it, but we just haven't seen any evidence of that whatsoever. Um, in fact, we see evidence of the opposite, um, where uh, um, mutations are more likely to occur in places where um, spread remains unchecked. Um, and again, you know, in part because, um, you know, I do really worry about, about immunocompromised people in particular. Thank you. We had a number of questions earlier on when um, you were talking about immunity. And I know you're not an immunologist related to those who had the vaccine, um, but yeah. there are a number of questions coming in about people who had COVID and had developed mm -hmm. sort of immunity yeah. to that. Could you speak to a little bit about that sort of immunity? Yeah. So I think it's highly likely that if you've had COVID, you have some level of protection. Mm -hmm. The challenge is we don't know how much. Um, it is possible it's better than we've thought it is. And there was just a preprint that came out yesterday from Israel suggesting that people that had um, people that had prior infection plus one dose of vaccine seem to have the most protection against reinfection as compared with people who had just two doses of vaccine and people who um, had not, you know, no, no vaccine. Um, so I think it is likely that you get some protection. But we've also seen people who have had infection be reinfected. So it's probably possible that it's related to how severe of an initial infection you had. And if you had a mild one, perhaps you're not well as protected as if you had a more severe one. Um, you know, I personally, what I take from this is um, one, we shouldn't discount that prior infection causes any level of protection because it clearly does. It's just hard to figure out exactly how much. So for me, you know, getting at least one shot um, if not two, is like checking all the boxes and making sure you're covered. And there's real there, there's no downside to doing that. There is no worry that if you've had the infection and then you get vaccinated that you're going to have a worse reaction or that you're going to have long COVID. I mean, the, I've heard a lot of concerns about that. If I hadn't had COVID, I would have not hesitated to go out and get 
two shots. Now we can argue as scientists whether you need two shots or one or if you need it at all, but like at this point, not fully knowing, it's it's kind of a gamble. And let me tell you, vaccines are the safer path to protection than infection because you although if you're like a young and healthy person, you know, statistically you're gonna survive your infection. It's hard to know as an individual if you're in the statistical average or if you're on the tails and, and the people, the person who's gonna die. And so I'm all about thinking of how to, you know, how do we make our lives easier and kind of minimize the risks and, and worries and um, getting vaccinated um, is it, very clearly a way to do that. Thank you. And I think I had mentioned the statistic about Delta in particular, which is of great concern to a lot of people right now and it's transmissibility and it's spread. Um, our current measures, could you talk a little bit about its transmissibility? I don't know if that's even a word, yeah. <laughs> how it's being transmitted. Um, you know, our social distancing, our mask, like what measures are, do we know um, can and should be helpful um, for re in addition to of course being vaccinated um, to help reduce the spread of Delta? So Delta is more transmissible. Um, we've seen this now in, in, in data sets. And I think there's a few reasons why that's happening. One is it seems like if um, I were to be exposed, the time to which I would become contagious is a bit shorter than it was for earlier forms of the virus. Um, so that just means that like over a period of time, I can potentially infect more people because I have more now time to do that. We also know that people um, tend to be a bit, have more of a higher viral load and more likelihood of being able to put virus out um, earlier in their illness, potentially even less of a, you know, even, but we, are, we, we've always known that people without symptoms could potentially spread it, but um, potentially it, it's, it's a bit earlier. So that means that you can more likely to spread it when you don't know it. Um, and uh, so, so that just makes it challenging. It might also be on, on balance if you're getting infected a longer time period in which, you know, you, you can transmit it. Um, so we are seeing the growth of cases increasing more quickly than we saw with previous versions of the virus. Um, that's just how the virus works, but how we work to stop it has not changed. So vaccines is the thickest layer of protection. Um, you know, people who are vaccinated, even if they are to become infected, even if they are to develop symptoms and develop disease, um, the period of time in which they would be contagious is shorter. Um, and um, we also think that it cuts down the likelihood of having symptoms, um, any symptoms. And we certainly know that it helps keep you out of the hospital. So, so that's great. So vaccines are the thickest form of protection. But you know, if you want to, if you say you're a vaccinated person and you're wondering what you can do to further reduce your chances of getting Delta, all the things we've been doing since hearing about this virus, you know, wearing masks, avoiding crowded indoor spaces, keeping your distance from people, um, you know, trying to preferentially socialize with other vaccinated people if you can, um, you know, uh, trying to avoid um, huge, huge gatherings. Those are all the things that you can choose to do to further limit your, your likelihood of coming in contact with the virus. Thank you. Um, let's, let's move this idea and concept of vaccines and Delta as it relates to children, um, children under 12. Uh, a lot going on here, a lot of concerns, both with schools coming back into session, um, what we looks like more hospitalizations happening in children. When can we expect potentially vaccines for the younger populations? And what do we know about the role of Delta um, infecting younger populations? Yeah, so this is a really important question for me personally, because I've got two kids who are too young to be vaccinated. So I'm, I'm in this boat that many other parents are in. Um, so what we know about COVID and kids right now is, I would say, relatively unchanged in the sense that um, uh, when the overall number of cases increases, the childhood ca cases and kids also increase. And the same thing tracks for hospitalizations, right? So, so more cases, you know, some fraction of that will result in, in hospitalizations. Um, there is some question as to whether Delta makes people sicker. Um, I will tell you, I have not seen compelling data on that. Some clinicians who just are seeing patients feel like the answer to that question is yes, others say no. Um, of course, the, the possibility of that makes people worry, um, understandably. Um, the other thing that we see in the, the pediatric COVID case data is that pediatric cases tends to follow adult cases. So if adults get sick, 
they may spread it to the kids in their lives. And so if you're a parent and you're wondering what you can do to protect your children who are too um, young to be vaccinated, the most important thing you can do is make sure that all the adults in their lives are vaccinated. And that's why I think, you know, you're seeing school districts increasingly pushing to have teachers and staff in schools vaccinated because that's an important way to protect children in those settings. Um, and then in terms of protecting children, again, it's the same measures that we've been using, you know, masks and distance and avoiding crowded indoor spaces. Um, you know, since I have children in, in those circumstances, I, um, we're all making kind of risk benefit decisions and our level of risk tolerance um, is all a little bit different. Um, I know for our family, we prioritize risks that we think are beneficial to the health and development of our children. So for that reason, school in, in our minds is, is a very important thing. And if we have to minimize exposures in other settings to um, you know, just account for the, the fact that now they're in school and they're gonna be around more people than they were uh, when they weren't in school, um, you know, we, we choose to do that. I personally feel um, comfortable sending my children to school. It's not a zero risk prospect, but I, um, where I live in Maryland, um, the cases aren't um, as good as they had been earlier, um, but certainly not as bad you know, as bad as some other parts of the country. If I were in a state where the cases were surging and where a governor is res restricting any level of mitigation in the classroom, I would be a lot more nervous. Thank you. Uh, we've had a lot of news coming out recently, including the Pfizer vaccine getting full approval um, from the emergency use use authorization. We've talked a little bit in past episodes about the EUAs um, and how they were designed, um, but I'm wondering, you know, how do you, people think about this news and understand EUAs? I know I think Moderna has officially submitted their paperwork. Is this a paperwork thing or, and this is going to move into me asking you a little bit about some of the vaccine hesitancy mm -hmm. that has been attributed to people having concerns about it under an emergency use authorization, not full approval. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that and how that leads to how, what your thoughts are under on the vaccine hesitancy yeah. population. Yeah, so I will say it's just starting with the vaccine hesitancy. I've heard from a lot of people who are not yet convinced about vaccines that one of the things that they were waiting for was um, FDA approval of the vaccines. Um, Sometimes they were waiting for themselves, but um, probably more frequently I heard it from parents who were themselves vaccinated, but were waiting it for it for their children. The thing I told parents in those situations is that I understand that, you know, that the idea that there's like another level of, of check, I can see why that is reassuring. I just didn't fundamentally expect the facts to change um, by the time approval came such that I didn't really see the benefit of their waiting. I didn't. I just didn't think it was going to change that much. There is a difference for sure. And one of the differences is that full approval is for forever, <laughs> you know, and part of what the negotiations were was about, you know, how long it could be stored in, in, in doctor's offices and the refrigerators that they have there. There was a lot of additional review. I won't say that it was, there's no difference because there is. Um, I just didn't think in the, the for the things that people cared about, um, you know, is this going to be safer for me right now um, that we, the facts were going to change. Um, I hope approval makes people more comfortable. It should. I mean, there, I think there's been a really rigorous um, evaluation. One of the reasons why we don't yet have vaccines um, for under 12, I mean, the FDA just went back to Pfizer and said, expand your studies and include more children to look for rarer events. I have a lot of colleagues who are pushing for a faster decision on vaccines. Um, I'm not <laughs> necessarily, I mean, I would love to have a vaccine for my children because it would just eliminate some additional worries. Um, but I think it's really important for parents in particular to understand that the process is happening in a stepwise, um, you know, evidence-based manner. It's not being rushed in any way. Yes, we're in an emergency. Yes, obviously we don't want children to get vaccinated, but the risk benefit calculation for children is you can't argue with this, is different than it is for older, um, for adults. And so they, there, there is going to be a higher standard of scrutiny um, for pediatric vaccines than there will be for adults, just because the likelihood of severe outcomes is, is much smaller. Um, so I, um, you know, what we are seeing is a big difference is that many employers were waiting for FDA uh, approval before they were going to mandate vaccines, um, including the Department of Defense. Uh, is now um, will be mandating it. And I think that these vaccine mandates 
um, that we're seeing from employers, I mean, they just keep coming. And I think that that's going to, to change who's vaccinated and who's not. Did you, do you have a timeline for the children, for the children? anything you all are talking about for that? that so what I hear is probably not before the end of the year, like the calendar year. Um, I think the hope was that they would have data by the by September and that it would be closer initially, it would be closer to, you know, kind of late fall. Um, but um, it's probably not till the end of the year. I do also have to say, I don't expect this to happen. But it is possible that they won't approve. I mean, I don't, I don't think there's any, I have no evidence to say they're not going to approve it. But I always just say, like, I feel like so many people are just kind of biding time until it happens. And I hope we have the vaccines, but you know, um, the approval process um, is gonna find what it finds. And like I said, the calculation is not quite as straightforward for very young children as it is for even teens. For teens, I think there's a much more compelling risk benefit calculation. Not that there isn't for children, but um, so I think we have to just continue to do what we're gonna do and make decisions for our children, hoping that we're gonna have a vaccine, but also not completely banking on it. Thank you. Um, I don't wanna leave people with the impression that we're not going to have a vaccine. I just wanna say that um, let's let the science work its way out and, and, and not push it. Yeah. I appreciate that. Thank you for sharing um, that perspective. Um, that question comes up a lot, I think, just because of particularly people, you have children yourself concerns and wanting things to start to feel like they can get them semi back to normal and school's been hard decisions for this fall. So um, you, I appreciate at one point, I want to talk a little bit about some communication things here, um, because at one point, you know, one of the questions you, I appreciate you being really clear, like that is misinformation. And, and we talk a lot about misinformation at the Institute. Um, so this isn't misinformation, but I'm curious about the terminology of breakthrough COVID cases. Yeah. Um, and you talked a little bit about this, I think when you were talking about immunity, um, to be personally honest, I think the my perception is that may not be the best term to talk about COVID because I think it led to a false perception that people wouldn't there wouldn't get COVID even if you were vaccinated. And so all of a sudden it's a breakthrough that you did and it's catching people by surprise. So that's my own personal opinion on thinking about that word and terminology. I wonder if you could speak to breakthrough cases. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think we have to be very clear when we're talking if we're talking about infection or if we're talking about disease. Again, the virus is what infects you. And then depending on how your body reacts, you may get the disease. Um, the disease uh, will require um, you know, some, some symptoms. Um, you know, I think we probably should not talk about breakthrough infections because that suggests that we ever expected vaccines to prevent infection. I think, if anything, we hoped that they would do more to prevent productive infections <laughs> that go on to develop disease. Um, but uh, I, there's, I don't see any reason why we should have ever expected vaccines to prevent infection because again, all the way vaccines work is they train your immune system to respond when your cells are infected. Um, hope, the question is, you know, how quickly can it do that? Can it do that before you get any level of disease? I think what we're seeing now is more people who are vaccinated developing disease, um, though mild, generally mild. Um, so I think when you hear things like breakthrough infections are rare, that's a bit of, I think, wrong language. And we probably shouldn't be saying that. I think we should be saying breakthrough disease is um, still pretty rare, not as rare as it was a few months ago. Um, breakthrough severe disease, very rare, exceedingly rare. Um, breakthrough hospitalizations, incredibly rare. That's what CDC is tracking. And we, we definitely have the data on that to know that that's not happening frequently. And when it does, it's often people who have some level of underlying condition. Um, so just to say, you know, I do think that we are all gonna get infected with this virus throughout our, at some point in our lifetime. So for people who are on the fence about getting vaccinated, thinking like they could just kind of N95 mask and hole up until the virus goes away, that's, I just don't see that happening. Um, I do think that through increased vaccinations and defanging the virus, you know, taking 
off the table its ability to put people in the hospital and to kill them, that our relationship to the virus will change. And we will probably at some point stop tracking individual infections, you know, people who have PCR were, you know, positive in their nose, um, but are otherwise not sick. You know, I, I don't see that as being particularly relevant in the long term. Right now, given that we're very actively trying to control the spread of disease, um, this, you know, the spread of this virus that's still resulting in high levels of disease, we of course have to track these things. But I think at some point, our, our relationship to the virus is going to change. Could you talk a little bit more about, you just mentioned tracking the virus and the virus in the nose. Yeah, Could you sure. talk a little bit about that, please? Sure. So... The current recommendations are that fully vaccinated people who have no symptoms and no particular reason to think that they have COVID because they're not a contact of a case, that they shouldn't be tested. And part of it is that if you do get tested and you test positive, it's really actually hard to interpret because again, the, the way the vaccines work is that they train your immune system to go after the virus. So it's very possible that that positive test is catching at that moment when your immune system is doing exactly what the vaccine taught it to do and is going after the few cells that have the virus and is destroying it. That virus may not even be capable of infecting other people. It can, but we don't know. So it's it, that test alone doesn't, doesn't tell us. Um, certainly, if you have symptoms, it's important to get tested so that you know, so that you can take precautions so that even though you probably have less of a likelihood overall over the duration of your illness to spread to others, there is a period of time in particular where you may be more likely to do that. So it's good to know so you can stay home and protect yourself. Um, and certainly if you've been exposed um, you know, to a case, um, think about um, potentially getting tested, although when, and how, when exactly you do that is a little bit trickier, but um, uh, those are the, the most compelling reasons. Um, but when you hear of, of people who are vaccinated, who have no symptoms, but are part of, say, a business or a sports team in which they are regularly being tested, and you're hearing about those positives, those positives alone don't necessarily make me worry. If those people went on to become you know, ill, then that's a different story. Um, if they become quite ill, then that's when I really get concerned. But so far, I haven't seen a lot of data saying that people who are vaccinated get ill, get very, very ill. There's some, it, it is certainly happening, but it's, it's so far um, quite rare. Okay, keep it on testing. We had a question earlier um, about the, if you could speak to any advantages or disadvantages of either going to a COVID testing center uh, versus using an at-home rapid test. So it's really, I think, operational at this point. Um, I, I was in the similar boat. My daughter had a exposure at a daycare and I needed to get her tested. Um, so the PCR tests um, are generally thought of as being more sensitive. So they're more likely to find virus, viral genetic material in your nose. Um, though the additional times that they'll find it compared to other types of tests may not be as, as important from a public health standpoint. Um, nonetheless, because they may detect it earlier, um, or even later in your illness than, than the rapid test that you could potentially buy, you'll still hear of some places requiring a PCR test. The downsides of PCR are that um, they take time to get those test results back. And in the case of my having to go and get my daughter um, tested, uh, you know, I found out about her daycare exposure six days after it, her last exposure to the infected teacher. Um, so, um, you know, they say between five and seven days, you should get tested. And so I wanted to, to get a PCR test. Um, I, I probably shouldn't have even bothered because after we got our swab, first of all, it was incredibly hard to find a place that would do it on that day. And I think that's a common story. Um, but when we did find a place, um, they told us that it would be two to five days before we get our test results back. And it wound up being, I think, maybe four days. Um, so the challenge is that the test is only tells you what you were that day. If you get your results four days later, you don't know if those results are still relevant. Um, I think there's some real advantages for the rapid tests. Sure, they may not find um, smaller amounts of virus in your nose um, at the very beginning or the very end of infection, but you can repeat them and you can get the test results in, in 15 minutes. The downside is that you have to pay for the ones that are in you know, the, the, the pharmacies. Um, and it's not, it's not inexpensive. It's, you know, the, the one that I purchased that we ultimately wound up using was $25 for two 
tests. Um, I really valued having that, but I know for a lot of people that that's just like, you know, that you're going to, you're going to think about how many times you're going to use those tests, but there may be circumstances in which you need to do that. And you need to get timely test results. So I say, whichever testing circumstances work for you based on your condition, um, then that's, that's helpful. Great. Thank you. Yeah. I was um, at a pharmacy recently and, and saw all the tests on the background and the, the person um, at the store said, we are one of the only pharmacies that have these right now. And she's like, we will very soon have a line of people out the door wanting them. And they were $30 um, for a test. So the, the um, downside from a public health perspective is that those test results don't usually get reported. So if everybody started using those, we wouldn't be counting those cases. Mm -hmm. I have long been worried about that. I'm still worried about it. As someone who, you know, is tracking the, the reported case numbers every day, I'm still worried about it. Um, but if it doesn't, if the alternative is that you don't get test results in a timely enough manner to, to take the public health action, which is what testing is supposed to do in the first place, then I would much rather people get the tests and, you know, stay home when they're supposed to um, than pushing for a test that is just providing test results too late for people to act within the small window of time they have. Great, thank you. We are coming up on our time. I think I'm gonna um, give you one short question if possible and then give you a, a chance to share some closing thoughts on the future. But um, this question came in about, are there any studies underway to investigate the impacts of mi mixing and matching different vaccines? There are, and I think, um, they're encouraging so far, um, encouraging from a safety perspective, but also potentially in efficacy. And that's one of the questions that people are, people are also asking about if we need third doses, does it make sense to use the same vaccine that we've had or wait a bit and maybe boost with something else to train our immune system in a new way? And I think there's some data that suggests that the answer to that might be, maybe that's better. And so that's why I think if you hear uh, of people sort of you know pushing back on boosters, it's because we haven't fully figured out if it's if it's necessary, but also how to do it. That said, and maybe this will be my ending <laughs> comment, is just um, I sketched out global concerns, you know, tensions about you know we need to share vaccines with the rest of the world, um, and you know that there are these scientific debates um, that can be really overwhelming for individuals. Um, and you know, I will say even earlier um, when we authorized vaccines for teens. I was concerned that we were, you know, one of the first countries to start using in vaccine and still one of the only countries to use vaccines in a lower risk population when again, there are very high risk people dying across the world for lack of access. Um, I, well, you can have these debates about policy, which is really what it is and what we as a nation should be doing in terms of our policies around vaccines that's not on individuals <laughs> to fix, right? So if your doctor says, get the third dose, your refusing it is not gonna change the world's circumstances. Um, we can push for our government to do different things, but as individuals, you know, if, if, if your clinician is recommending something for you, you know, your, uh, listen to your clinician and you, you know, you're not gonna solve the world's problems in that office. Thank you um, very much, Dr. Nizzo. Um, I think that is actually a great note to end on. Um, we talk a lot about the role of policy and where that is. And so there's a lot of questions and people who wanna take individual action, um, both for their own health and their own safety, their own communities. Um, but you're absolutely right. The role of leadership and government in making these hard decisions possible is the role of government. So appreciate that. Thank you so much for your time today. We covered a lot of ground. Um, so I appreciate it. You just took all the questions in, in stride. So thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Take care. Yes, everybody. All righty. And thank you to all of our guests today. Um, I think you may have saw the slides if you joined early, but I just want to give a sh quick shout out and plug that the museum is hosting another vaccination clinic. It's on Sunday, September 5th. Um, from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. So if there is anyone that you don't know who needs a shot, um, please go ahead and bring them on down to the vaccine clinic on the museum. Uh, we have a lot of partners in collaboration with that. Um, and we'll be giving out family passes uh, to the museum that day for anyone who does uh, get that vaccine dose. Thank you all for joining us. Thanks for your great questions. Um, stay tuned. We'll have, we have recordings of this already available for those who want to pass it along. I see that Nicole has actually 
actually dropped links in the chat already. So go ahead and grab that YouTube link if you want to grab this video. It's already available. Send it to more people to watch. Um, stay safe, stay healthy, be kind to one another and your neighbors, um, and do what you can to help sl slow the spread of this um, COVID-19 pandemic. And hopefully we'll see you back here again soon, um, but with different news in the very near future. Thanks, everyone, for joining.